Hello and welcome to Arcadia University's VI327 Histology Lecture on Connective Tissue. And this is part four where we're going to talk about wandering cells within the connective tissue. Now, within the connective tissue, we said that the overall characteristic is that there are going to be cells with, um, essentially the cells are widely scattered with extracellular matrix between them. And so we've got the resonant cells like the fibroblasts, which we talked about in the previous mini lecture. And now we're going to talk about some wandering cells. So cells that essentially are commonly found within the connective tissue, uh, but are not always there. Basically, they're going to be moving through the body and moving through the connective tissue, responding to a variety of local signals. <clears throat> and these wandering cells will include things like uh, macrophages, mast cells, uh, lymphocytes, both well, small lymphocytes and, and plasma cells as well as polymorphonuclear nuclear leukocytes, uh, again, another type of, of white blood cells, uh, basically the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils. So we're going to take a look at these in a little bit more detail. And so uh, the macrophages are going to be a common cell in a variety of regions in the body. And essentially these are cells that are going to go through and they're going to be involved with essentially phagocytosing or engulfing either foreign materials, uh, they may engulf things that are uh, labeled by uh, antibodies as being foreign, or they're going to go through and essentially be involved with remodeling of uh, or, uh, regions within the tissue or repairing, essentially cleaning up uh, old uh, proteins, things like that. Now the macrophages in general are going to be relatively large stellate cells, so it's going to have lots of processes coming off. Although in normal uh, microscopy, you're not going to be able to see the processes. Uh, they're going to have an irregular shaped, bumpy, euchromatic nucleus. So instead of the, the kind of oval or round nuclei that we've seen before, this is going to have kind of a, an unusual appearance because it's going to look kind of bumpy and, and kind of lopsided. Uh, lots and lots of lysosomes are going to be found within the macrophages. Again, keeping in mind what these cells are going to be doing. They're going to be engulfing materials, bringing it in, and then combining the materials they're bringing in with the lysosomes, which are containing the acids and the enzymes to break down these materials. Uh, many times, if we want to study macrophages, we'll inject a, a dye into a region, and the macrophages will go in and kind of clean that up and essentially engulf the dye materials and label themselves. The second type of migratory cells are the mast cells. Uh, the mast cells are going to be relatively large, kind of an oval cell, that it's often found uh, in close proximity to capillaries. And the slide on the, the right-hand side, uh, the image on the right-hand side of the slide, is uh, mast cells growing in culture. So you normally wouldn't see this many mast cells in a histological specimen. But what you're going to see is going to be a large oval cell, which is going to be packed with basophilic granules. And these basophilic granules are going to be containing things like heparin and histamine. And basically what they're going to be doing is mediating an inflammatory response. So they're going to be responding to some type of allergic reaction and they're going to initiate that local inflammation response. If you think about what happens if you, you, know, you touch something you're allergic to, uh, automatically you're going to see uh, kind of a swelling in that region. And what happens is the mast cells are going to respond to that by releasing the histamine uh, the histamine and the heparin are going to regulate the permeability of the capillaries. And they're basically going to make the capillaries a little bit leaky. So we're going to have fluid flowing into that region with the idea that it's going to wash out the, the allergens, wash out these harmful materials, and flush them into the lymphatic circulatory system where they can be processed and removed from the body. And so that's primarily what the mast cells are going to be doing. Again, they're going to be involved with the normal reaction to an allergic response, but they can also, in a, a kind of a hyper state or uh, uh, an overactive state, contribute to allergic hypersensitivity reactions. And so again, they're going to be doing things like releasing the histamine. It's going to make the capillaries a little bit leaky, but as that histamine spreads throughout the body, it can cause almost an asthma-like response. You know, this, uh, kind of spasma contractions occurring within the smooth muscle of the bronchioles making it harder to, 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 uh, to breathe in. It can stimulate hypersecretion by the goblet cells and mucosal cells of the bronchi to essentially produce lots and lots of the mucus to trap and clean out that material. But it's basically going to give you things like the runny nose and uh, lots of, in essence, snot, which is going to be produced as a response. Um, and that's uh, 
the, the main response that the, the mast cells are going to be doing. Hyperactive response, hypersensitivity is going to cause a greater response um, within the body. The second type of cells we're going to find, and these are going to be very, very common cells within the, uh, within the connective tissue, are going to be the leukocytes. Uh, leukocytes is a, a fancy scientific term for the white blood cells. A wide variety of these cells are going to be found within the connective tissue, mainly underlying the epithelia, but in other connective tissues within the body. Many of these are going to be small lymphocytes. Uh, they're going to have a very heterochromatic nucleus, a very dark staining nucleus, not a whole lot of cytoplasm. So you can see kind of in the central portion of the image on the right-hand side of the slide, we've got a lot of basophilic staining, a lot of small cells, a lot of nuclei that we can see. These are a lot of small lymphocytes. Now some of these, and it's hard to tell with this magnification, but some of these lymphocytes are also going to be plasma cells. Plasma cells are going to be larger cells. They're going to have a clock face nucleus. Uh, so it's essentially going to be uh, a more euchromatic nucleus with clumps of heterochromatin around like the numbers on the clock. And the plasma cells are actually going to be involved with producing antibodies uh, within the region. So responding to some type of foreign material that needs to be identified and eliminated from the body. So here's an example of a small lymphocyte within the bloodstream. So you can see it's got a very densely heterochromatic nucleus. Nucleus may be slightly dented, but it's going to be hard to tell, especially on histological sections, and a very thin rim of cytoplasm around it. You're basically not going to be able to see the cytoplasm under most circumstances in a histological slide. What you're going to see is just lots of these densely heterochromatic nuclei packed within the region, and you're going to know that it's these small white blood cells, these small lymphocytes. At this point, we can't tell whether they're B lymphocytes or T lymphocytes uh, unless we use a special uh, stain for them. Uh, so in normal histological slides, we're just going to identify these as small lymphocytes. The plasma cells are essentially small lymphocytes, B cells, uh, that have been stimulated, and they're going to be synthesizing and secreting antibodies. Antibodies are proteins, and so what we'd expect is to see a more euchromatic nucleus, and we see the lighter staining of the nucleus in this point. We've got clumps of heterochromatin around the outside of the nucleus, giving it kind of that clock face appearance. But then we're going to have the characteristics of a protein synthesizing and secreting cell. Lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum that's going to be involved with producing the antibodies. And these antibodies are basically going to be dumped out uh, because the cell's already been triggered as a response to that foreign material. So it's going to be continuously dumping out these antibodies. Um, so you're not going to see a whole lot of secretory vesicles kind of accumulating within the plasma cells. Next, we're going to look at the polymorphonuclear uh, leukocytes. And so these are basically, again, a category of, of white blood cells, uh, but they're going to have basically some really strange looking nuclei. Now, the first of these are going to be the neutrophils. The neutrophils are going to be about 60 to 70 percent of the circulating white blood cells within the bloodstream, and they're also going to be found uh, migrating through the loose connective tissue. But in general, it's going to be very, very difficult to identify the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils within the connective tissue. You're only really going to be able to identify them within blood smears. If we take a look at the neutro neutrophils, they're going to have a lobe nucleus. So instead of the kind of intact nucleus that we've seen before, even the, the kind, of, uh, kind of bumpy nucleus we saw within the macrophage, within the neutrophils and the other polymorphonuclear lymphocytes, we're actually going to see the nucleus forming little clumps or little lobes. And now in the neutrophils, these lobes are going to be connected by thin chromatin bridges. And so in this example we've got on the right-hand side of the slide, we can see three lobes and they're joined by a little chromatin bridge. Now if we look in a little bit bigger detail, a little bit better uh, detail, a little bit better resolution, we would see that the neutrophils have lots of granules within their cytoplasm and they're going to have what are referred to as both specific granules and azurophilic, kind of the reddish purple granules that we can see in this uh, slide. Now if we take a look at what's found within these granules, what we're going to find is that they have a lot of antibacterial agents. They're going to have things like peroxidases and lysosomal enzymes. And basically what these cells do is they're going to be that first line of response as a cellular defense against foreign materials like bacteria. So they're going to be migrating through the body. They're going to respond to a, a cut in the skin or disruption of an epithelial lining. And they're going to migrate through the area looking for bacteria. 
Now, they're, they're basically very energetic, uh, almost a little bit hyper in essence, if you want to think about it. So they're going to go through and they're going to get very excited. They're going to dump out the peroxidases and the lysosomal enzymes, and they're going to start to ingest the materials that are in that region. And they're going to attack and destroy the bacteria. But along the way, they're also going to damage the healthier tissues. And so we're going to have to have the macrophages coming through a little bit slower, a little bit uh, more regulated in their response to clean up the damage that these neutrophils are doing. But keep in mind that we want these neutrophils to be that first line of defense because they're going to be able to move in very quickly and attack the bacteria before the bacteria become established. Now, if you've ever had uh, like a bacterial infection in the skin and you've had pus formation, that yellowish kind of gooey stuff uh, when you get a cut or a, a scrape, uh, the neutrophils are going to be the main component, dead neutrophils are going to be the main component uh, of the pus that's forming. That, again, is an indication that you had a bacterial uh, uh, infection that started and the neutrophils are in there and mounting a response to that. The next category we're going to look at are going to be the eosinophils. These are much rarer than the neutrophils. About 1 to 4 percent of the circulating white blood cells within the bloodstream. And if we take a look at them, they're going to have two lobes uh, within their nucleus and they're going to be joined by a thin bridge. Often very difficult to see uh, the bridge in these cases because the cytoplasm is going to be filled with very eosinophilic granules, essentially very pink staining granules if we take a look at it uh, in hematoxylin eosin. And these eosinophilic granules are, are basically lysosomes and doing the same type of thing that we've seen the lysosomes do previously. And so we take a look at this, these eosinophilic granules are essentially going to be involved in the allergic response as well as attacking parasites and parasitic infections. And so we got the lysosomes, we're also going to have some granules, they're going to be carrying histaminase and aerosulfatase, and they're essentially going to be going through and modulating the effects of the histamine that was released by the mast cells that we talked about a couple slides ago. So they're going to release an enzyme that's going to break down histamine. And so it's going to decrease the effects on the bloodstream. So get rid of the histamine, cause the blood vessels to not be as leaky. And if they're working properly, they're going to balance out the activity of these mast cells and limit the severity of these hypersensitivity reactions. Now, in terms of the lysosomes uh, that these eosinophils have, they're essentially going to be filled with hydrolytic enzymes like we've seen previously. And basically, the eosinophils are going to go and attack parasites. Uh, so things like worms, um, uh, they get into the body, uh, infect the body in some way. These eosinophils are going to be triggered by that. We see an increase in them in the bloodstream when there's a parasitic infection. And they basically track their way through the body to where the parasite is located. And they basically dump all these nasty acids and enzymes onto the parasite and begin digesting it from the outside in the hopes of killing it and uh, eliminating its threat to the body. The basophils are going to be the rarest of these uh, white blood cells circulating within the bloodstream, anywhere from about 0 to 1%, so relatively rare. They're going to have three lobes of highly condensed chromatin like we've talked about before, and it's going to be organized in kind of an S-shape. Again, it's going to be very difficult to see the nucleus in this case because the basophils are going to be packed with basophilic cytoplasmic granules. And so what we're going to see is that these cells are essentially going to have IgE on their surface. It's an antibody that is produced by plasma cells, the white blood cells producing antibodies we talked about before. The antibodies, these IgEs, are going to accumulate on the surface of these basophils and it's going to allow them to essentially respond to uh, the foreign material, the foreign antigen, when it finds that. So they're probably related to mast cells, but they migrate uh, much greater distances. The basophilic granules, because they are related to mast cells, are going to contain heparin and histamine. You're going to find these a lot uh, in areas of inflammation. Uh, they're going to be contributing to the hypersensitivity reactions. And again, overactivity can contribute to anaphylactic shock. So they're, again, doing things very, very similar to what we saw with these mast cells. And that's it for these wandering cells within the connective tissues. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. And hopefully you'll come back for part five of the connective tissue where we'll look at basic types of connective tissues.